and here we go. We have liftoff. Propulsion continues to be normal. Our 68 chamber pressure looks good. Following up. Hello everyone, welcome back to another live Starship update. We, well, we we had a little go yesterday, uh, but unfortunately, uh, because of reasons we'll get into shortly, it was not to be. Joining me uh, this afternoon, uh, we have Sawyer Rosenstein. How are you doing, Sawyer? I am doing great. I mean, it's a shame that uh, Starship is still on the pad, but that just means we're going to have to try again. And also, for the first time, I believe, on a live stream, we have uh, our new uh, uh, Kennedy-based uh, videographer. We have Max. How are you doing, Max? Not too bad, sir. It's glad to be here. It's always a good day in Starbase. Yeah, <laughs> it's a we very... Add it's a... Kennedy-based currently in Starbase. Yeah, Kennedy-based yes. <laughs> currently in Starbase. Yes. Yeah. It's a very sunny day down there at the moment, just gone four o'clock in the afternoon. And of course, I'm Ryan Caton. I'll be your host for today's show. Uh, we've got a few questions coming in before we went on air. Uh, but of course, if you're just tuning in now and you want your questions answered, uh, uh, tag us in chat at NASA Space Flight. We'll do our best to answer them as precisely as possible. And running around in the background, we have Kevin pushing the buttons, making today's broadcast go. So, uh, first off, Sawyer, I'll, I'll go to you. Uh, how were your emotions yesterday? Because we got so close. Uh, I mean, it's a good thing I wasn't wearing a heart rate monitor because I think it went all over the place. <laughs> you go from excitement to the calm and the lull, and then it's going to go, and then the frustration from the scrub, but then the excitement that, you know what, we get to try again. So uh, I think, yeah, it's all over the place. Max, how about you? Because you're down in Starbase, how was, how was yesterday for you? You know, around launches like this, typically, especially monumental or historical missions, um, the, the feeling was very similar to Artemis 1 in the fact that a lot of built up nerves and, and an anticipation. Um, and we were, I was lucky enough to be joining the crew up on top uh, for a good view overlooking the pad. And the, the, the people around us were getting pretty. I did pretty emotional, uh, but the thing is, when you're, you know, when you're on duty and you're on, and you're on the field, you try not to let emotions take over the whole thing. You know, you're there, for, you're there to focus and get your job done. So, while it was uh, pointing to have its day, um, it was still very, 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 very exciting. And the fact that this is actually real. Yeah, that's a that's a point that uh, uh, was was kind of going in and out of my brain yesterday, like. Wait, is this real? Wait, no, surely not. But but it is. But it's, uh, how, how? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The it, the we, actual it, representation of the is this real life meme. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so there's a there's a question here from Vic saying uh, stuck valve NASA space flight. I assume that's to do with the delayed start. Uh, we're about five minutes late. Sorry for that. Uh, but uh, genuinely, Sawyer, uh, is is that all we know right now? Uh, again, from our understanding, it's that there was a pressure valve uh, on the booster itself that the issue occurred on, that the uh, valve got stuck. So I know just talk about the term, the valve being frozen. That doesn't necessarily mean that it stayed in that exact position because it was legitimately covered in ice or the super cool temperatures from the propellant forced it that way, but it was stuck uh, in the wrong position. 
and uh, uh, Trevor asking, uh, do you think the uh, potential uh, delay uh, from the 20th of April is vehicle or weather related? So uh, this is in relation to the fact that the temporary flight restriction on the FAA website for Thursday has disappeared. Now, we haven't got any official word why this is. Uh, uh, TFRs can be moved about, so... Uh, there's no confirmation of this or anything, uh, but to fly, SpaceX will need a TFR. Uh, so, Max, do you think the weather could be getting worse, uh, potentially? Or do you think uh, SpaceX could be troubleshooting this valve a bit more? What do you think? It could be either or, or a combination of both. Um, the forecast toward the latter half of the week, anyway, wasn't looking too promising. Um, but e even though it was trending in the right direction, as we like to say, um, it still wasn't ideal for cloud cover and most importantly the winds both lower and upper level um, So but again it, That doesn't necessarily mean that it's just it, that it's just the weather uh, SpaceX could be having some more additional issues that we don't know about with the booster uh, Which could be adding to their delays and also uh, dropping their confidence for an, an attempt on the 20th So it could be either or from 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 what we know it could be either and uh, there's a good point coming in here, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, from uh, Gurney asking, any ideas of why Starship is not attempting several orbits? Uh, Sawyer, why is Starship only doing uh, not even a full orbit? Why is it just kind of doing a skip into the atmosphere? My best guess at this would have to be the fact that uh, in the event that something goes wrong, you can always have it come back to Earth guaranteed. Let's say you go for orbit on the first try, you get into orbit, and then your thrusters malfunction. And at that moment, you have no way of bringing Starship back down, and now you just have a giant piece of floating space debris that you have to wait until it eventually deorbits over time. Whereas in this case, in the event something goes wrong, an engine doesn't fire, uh, it's guaranteed that it will re-enter. Thank you, indeed. And uh, Lucas has a question here. Uh, could they... Oh, here's the trajectory actually now. So this is the uh, planned uh, uh, route that Starship will be taking over Earth. It'll be threading the needle between Florida and the Caribbean, going over the southern half of Africa, just uh, touching... Gre uh, not Greenland, Madagascar uh, on the south there, just slightly overflying uh, Papua New Guinea and uh, going over uh, just north of Australia and then uh, splashing down uh, at somewhere around Hawaii. The, uh, the Notmar for the splashdown zone, the debris hazard zone, is uh, it's like I think it's thousands of miles long. It's, it's very, very long. Uh, this is that uh, zone now. So the splashdown hazard zone is a little red box north of Hawaii. Uh, however, the actual debris zone is absolutely massive mm. the fact that you can see the like the, you can see the the outer edge of the earth there with that you can see the curvature of the earth within the hazard zone it's huge it is absolutely gargantuan so there you go that's the uh, uh debris zone for when starship comes in uh now going to lucas's question here asking could they launch during the weekend uh max are we expecting a, a, any launch attempts during the weekend or is this restricted to just the weekdays that, I don't know. I haven't seen anything uh, on the weekends for either NUTMs or TFRs uh, or anything or any other announcements from either at the FAA or SpaceX. In theory, it could be done. A TFR uh, could be issued on either Saturday or Sunday. Uh, same with all other uh, restrictions and um, announcements or advisories. It is, it is possible, uh, but that also heavily depends on whether SpaceX is actually ready or not to actually send a Starship off the pad. So, in theory, it is possible. Yeah, but we've also seen road closure, uh, or should I say theoretical scheduled road closures uh, for uh, non-weekend -week, uh, times. So the road closures are only kind of uh, getting provisionally put in place for the weekdays, so I guess... Um, part of that could be the fact that Boca Chica Beach, there's some kind of rule where SpaceX needs to allow access. So I don't know whether that can play into the uh, potential days that SpaceX can launch as well. And those are the current road closures which are in, which are in place. The primary date is for uh, Thursday the 20th and an alternative date for that primary date is the 21st. Both of them from midnight till 2 o'clock in the afternoon local time. 
Now, quickly, before we get into some more questions, I just want to thank some of the support we've been getting over the last few minutes. John has become a Launch Director member. Thank you very much for that, John. We also have uh, Kenrico becoming a Pad Rat member. We Will Rocket You has uh, gifted a Red Team membership, and uh, that means that whoever was luckily received that gets access to our brand new Red Team and Above member multi-view, uh, which is live for all of the launch attempts uh, that SpaceX does, and it means you get access to every single well i'm not not every single because some of them are f uh, purely for photography but many 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 different cameras that we have stationed all around starbase all around boca chica uh, on top of the hotel all of that mm. jazz so if you would like access to that multi-view which you can see on your screen right now um, there are multiple views uh, a few of them are doubled up at the moment but they will uh, get singled out into their own uh, cameras uh, as we approach launch day some cameras are obviously not online right now because we don't have teams set up for launch because it's not happening right now uh, but those will be coming online as we approach t zero so if that's interested uh, if that interests you red team and above get access to that uh, we also have a two dollar donation here thank you very much for that as well as a super chat from nate and uh, uh, musical wolves asking uh, was the frozen valve caused by a chilling issue or local temperature Sawyer, have we had any uh, a word on what caused that frozen valve, or if it, or, or have we not been told anything? Haven't been told anything about that yet. Again, it's just that the uh, pressurization valve was stuck. Again, don't know the exact definition of frozen in this case. If it was legitimately actually frozen, or it was just stuck in the actuator that would need to close, it didn't activate. So. Uh, they're not giving as much details publicly on that, so as of now, that's about as much as we know. Uh, Andy Ford has become a Capcom member. That means you get access to the Discord server uh, if that's something you fancy. Uh, we also have Alex upgrading to Capcom and MDHC becoming a Capcom member. Thank you very much for that. And uh, we have uh, a couple of new Pad Rat members as well. Thank you very much for uh, uh, those joining the uh, membership program. And... Uh, uh, we uh, oh another question here for Musical Wolves actually with uh, uh, coming in with loads of super chats. Thank you very much, Musical Wolves. A very common name here uh, has a full stack wet dress rehearsal uh, with uh, uh, being uh, being fully fueled happened before. Max, have we seen a full stack wet dress rehearsal with fully uh, with a uh, both booster and ship being fully fueled before? I believe they have done a full fueling test beforehand. Whether that was officially labeled a full-on wet dress rehearsal, I'm not entirely sure. Um, but I believe, I, I can't remember exactly when that was, but I think that, I think it has been done before, yes. I believe they did, and I think we actually covered it if we go back to our past live streams. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, the, I, think that was, I think that was back in January. Uh, January 23rd, I think it was. Yep, Alex confirming in the back channel, January 23rd. The entire sense of time inside of my brain for the, for the Starship program in the last four months has just evaporated entirely because so much has happened. We've had static fires and wet dress rehearsals and so many different kinds of tests all leading up to uh, yesterday. And yet, for some reason, for me, yesterday kind of uh, sprung up on me. I wasn't... It, it seems as if the uh, point from stack to launch was super quick uh and i guess it's because we saw the ship going up and then it came down again for flight termination system arming and then it went up again just two days before the first launch attempt it just seems like even though we've been sitting on basically uh basically on booster 7 and ship 24 for the last year or so it seems as if this launch has sprung up on us really quickly soya did did you feel similarly to to that Uh, so are you talking while muted? Uh, so it, it looks like we've lost Sawyer there. Uh, but Max, how about you? Did, 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 did this feel like it sprung up upon you? Um, you know, based on all the testing that they've done previously in the previous months and how how well, dare I say, everything seemed to go and how straightforward it seemed, it did, this valve issue did seem very surprising. Um. So and not, certainly not something that we ever like to see. You know, we know that it's a common practice for any any uh, aerospace manufacturer to be flowing nitrogen through any of their fuel lines. Uh, Max, it seems as if we're getting a little bit of... Oh, that's not you. Uh, we're getting the 
uh, echo through the program. Hang on. Let's see, hang on. It appears to just be something in our back channel, I believe. Uh, yeah. I'll just stand by that on for a second because it's a little bit distracting for us. Sorry, everybody. And I'll just see. Yes, that has appeared to have stopped now. Sorry for that, everybody. We're getting a little bit of echo back here, but uh, we can get going again. Uh, so, Max, uh, yeah, sorry for cutting you off there. Uh, uh, no, it's all if good. You want, yeah, if you want to uh, carry on where you left off. Yeah, sure. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, so we know, it, but in short, to answer your question, yes, it very was. It, it, it was very much so surprising um, because every their test before I've seen to yield positive results uh, at towards the end, um, and we know. We're not, we're not sure. It has not been made public. SpaceX has not announced what has caused the issue or where exactly the problem is. Um, we know they like to flow nitrogen uh, through fuel lines, through all through pumps and everything to keep the moisture out and keep everything clean. Maybe some moisture intruded. We're not sure. Uh, that's, just, that's, all, that's my, only my personal speculation. Um, but it was certainly unexpected, to say the least. And we have just received a tweet here uh, from Eric Berger uh, in the, uh, how long ago was this? Uh, this was literally in the last few minutes here saying, uh, this is Eric Berg from our Technica saying, April 20th is definitely out for the Starship flight test per two sources. No confirmation on whether it slips just a day or further. For more details, I will refer you to SpaceX's social channels. So the, uh, mm. Sawyer, the retraction of the uh, TFR for thursday seems to be uh, pretty official now with no launch attempt according to eric berger uh at this point i wouldn't go as far as to say it just yet we're i tend to wait till official sources personally but that's just me uh, so i am waiting for spacex or elon to tweet the full update uh and until then they do have the ability if they decide to change their mind they can have the uh, TFR, as long as they coordinate it with the FAA and the range at a later date or time on the 20th. So it's still very slightly possible until we get official word from either Elon or SpaceX. Yeah, and um, we've been kind of judging, guessing off of uh, TFRs and not Mars and uh, WB57 schedules. But as I just said, we won't know officially until we get any word from SpaceX through the likes of uh, Twitter uh, or anything uh, like that. Uh, en en Enzio, sorry if I'm pronouncing that incorrectly, uh, is asking, uh, what would happen if it would lift off anyway uh, with that uh, frozen valve? Uh, Sawyer, uh, do we know what would have happened? If I mean, uh, <laughs> we don't know for sure, but there's always that potential of if the valve is fully closed, then you could have a pressure imbalance. So some of that might be able to leak out. Your tank isn't fully pressurized. Uh, and then you're not getting all of the fuel down into your engines. So it could either leak fuel out or probably more likely not allow enough fuel to get to the engines if that pressure just all of a sudden disappears. So uh, that would be my understanding as to what could happen if that was the case. And again, just a reminder that if you have any questions for us, you can tag us at NASA Space Flight, and we will do the best we can to answer them. In the meantime, I uh, want to take a couple Super Chats here. NNA, uh, thank you for your support. Asking any concerns about CME events, coronal mass ejections events, for tomorrow and Thursday. Uh, they are keeping an eye on space weather in addition to regular weather, uh, so we will have to watch out for that. Uh, Gibbsy, thank you very much for the support. Is the ultimate plan still to catch the booster and the chopsticks? From my understanding is yes, but not for this particular flight. So that's something we'll keep an eye on down the line here. Uh, we've got Thomas Miller, Milner, excuse me, upgrading to red team member. And uh, Pippin Junction also becoming a red team member. Don't forget, red team and above gets access to our multi-view, where you can see all the different cameras during this stream and again on launch day. Uh, Calderstein, will you see Booster 7 coming back down from the shore? Uh, I think it's possible. We'll have to keep an eye out on that. 
and Eric Beavers with a very tremendous amount of support here with the $50 super chat saying, just in case you dorks need another camera, here's my contribution. Good job on Monday, by the way. Obviously, full commitment is not something NSF shies away from. Cheers. Those are really kind words, and we really mean it because full commitment is definitely what we're trying to do here. We are trying to get every asset we have out to give you the best viewing experience for this historic event. So thank you, Eric. Thank you very much. Ryan, back to you. Here we go. Apologies for that, everybody. Some restarts decided to happen by themselves without my permission. Uh, but I'm back. Uh, fingers crossed if you can all hear me. Okay. And uh, uh, we will rocket you with another question here. Uh, asking, did they disarm the flight termination system on the booster? Sawyer, have we seen any FTS dis, uh, disengagements? Or are they keeping them engaged uh, for the uh, uh, upcoming attempts? At this point, they are still engaged. So it's, again, I'll have to kind of clarify that a little bit in the fact that it is in a less safe mode. So that doesn't mean that one little spark or you accidentally press the wrong button and the whole ship's going to blow up on the pad. All that means is that one of the additional redundant safety features is removed, which we've seen them pulling those remove for flight tags. And they were only able to do that once they destacked Ship 24. So the fact they haven't destacked it means that's all the same. And we will, of course, during the real count, keep the full ear out for when the full flight termination system is activated, meaning that if something goes wrong, the automated system will fire the command to self-destruct. And uh, Space Cowboy here has a question asking, uh, do we think SpaceX will avoid a hot fire abort due to the damage from eight seconds of Raptor fire? Maybe if they ignite and there's nothing very, very wrong, they will commit. Sawyer, what do we think about that? Do we think SpaceX will keep going even if they're not sure? I mean, here's the thing. At this point, I think they have a margin that they want to go within in terms of the number of engines. Uh, standby, we're getting an update here that new TFRs are out. I will answer the question in just a second. They are for April 23rd and 25th. So again, new TFRs, April 23rd and 25th. That's interesting, actually, because that goes on to what Max was talking about earlier with the weekends. The 23rd is this Sunday. Uh, the TFR for Friday still remains. So that's yes. a TFR for Friday, a TFR for Sunday, and a TFR for a week from now, next Tuesday. Uh, yep, 21st, 23rd, and 25th now are the official TFR dates. Uh, yeah, so uh, Max, you're pretty spot on there with your answer from earlier. And uh, yeah, there you go on screen now. You can see the uh, the FAA uh, uh, website. Uh, the, that is the ex uh, precise TFR from Starbase leading out into the Gulf, uh, yeah. which you can see there. To finish answering the usual question, by the way, about uh, avoiding a hot fire, I would think that they would have limits that they want to stick within. So obviously the main goal would be have all 33 engines up and running. But if you only have 30 or 28 of those engines up and running, I don't think you want to lift off regardless. At that point, I'd say that they would very likely still do the abort at that point. And worse comes to worse, you take it off the mount and you do a quick, a few fixes to the orbital launch mount and try again. Whereas if you have five engines out and you still launch anyway, there is zero shot of trying to fly again with booster seven. Yeah. Uh, looking through some more questions here again if you're just joining us tag us in chat at NASA space flight if you have a question uh, we want to try and get as many questions answered before the OFT uh, about Starship of course we'll answer them afterwards but uh, it's a good opportunity if you uh, uh, have a question you uh, or have something you don't know the answer of we'll see if we can help uh, by offering our, our uh, somewhat expertise and uh, to try and get those answered <coughs> excuse me sorry uh, we have a question here uh, from uh, Space Podcasts uh, asking, why did SpaceX use a pipe structure for the chopsticks? Uh, will they cover it for future launches from the orbital launch pad? Now, Max, do we think that they'll cover the chopsticks in future or will we just keep it as kind of like a, a pipe framework structure? Uh, well, if, if SpaceX's launch animation is any uh, data point to go off of for the future it looks like they may as well as the tower um however we have no official word or we have no real information to speculate on how however that would look pretty cool uh but i honestly i'm not sure 
And uh, uh, apparently we have a third, third, third TFR for Monday, uh, uh, which is now coming up. Uh, there, there we go. Is. No shape currently available, uh, but uh, there you go. That's a, 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 a more information from the FAA on that uh, NOTAM, uh, which uh, was issued uh, just a short while ago. So that would be tomorrow, uh, Sunday, Monday, and Wednesday, if I'm understanding that correctly, then? Uh, yes, it looks like that. Getting into some more questions here, then. Uh, we, <laughs> John is saying, got a uh, exclamation mark valve bot command ready. <laughs> That's a good one, John. <laughs> and um, did we have an engine three command for SLS? I can't remember. I think there's an E3 command, yes. Okay, okay. Of course there is. Chris Bergen's always on top of them. Yeah, and when I meant tomorrow, I meant uh, for the 21st. My apologies on that. So lose track of what day it is with all of the uh, Starship attempts. <laughs> no worries, Sawyer. As I said earlier, my sense of time is completely evaporated as well. Um, I, uh, is it Tuesday today? Yes, it is. <laughs> uh, uh, Geo is asking, does Starship need a uh, new propellant after the scrub? Can the fuel not be reused after the wet dress rehearsal, even with no liftoff? Uh, Sawyer, what do we know about the recycle capability uh, of Starship, if anything at all? So the way that they have the fuel farm set up currently is that they have enough fuel in there for to fill 1.2 full stacks. Uh, I don't know who that point two is, uh, but I guess that would be in the case of if, you know, as you get uh, propellants that burn off, uh, you need to replenish it and basically keep it in top off for the entirety of the window. So that's the case. But with the fact that they completely fully fueled it now, uh, that means that basically uh, they need to refill all the tank farms. And we've been seeing dozens and dozens of trucks with propellant coming up to the tank farm to refill. So... Uh, it seems like that is the biggest bottleneck here and that they can't just go the next day even if they fix it because they need to get more fuel back into the tank farms that they can then load up into the ship and the booster. Yeah, and literally as we cut to this wide shot, you could see a truck yeah. <laughs> going by. So good Great timing job, by Kevin. us on there. Yeah, there yeah, we good go. Job, Kevin. Thanks, Thanks, Kevin. Switch. And um, uh, we have a question here. Uh, asking, do you really think SpaceX was able to solve the problem in that short amount of time, or is it likely that the exact same thing will happen again uh, on Thursday? Uh, this is from a few minutes ago before the TFRs were officially uh, released for Friday. So uh, from what we understand from TFRs and Eric Berger, we are not going for a Thursday attempt with Starship. Uh, but Sawyer, anyways, uh, do we think that uh, SpaceX would have been able to fix the issue in a short amount of time ready for Friday? I think they can. Uh, again, a lot of it is what the issue actually is. So uh, apologies if I talk a little slower. I'm just getting an echo, but it should be clear for you guys in stream. Um, I think that it's, they dealt with something very similar before on Falcon 9. You have valves that will eventually get stuck open. Uh, I think it was actually just within the last year they've even had a launch that delayed because of that. So it's but the fact that they're also able to go out and take a look at the rocket physically right now too i think that improves their odds of being able to go out and fix it if they absolutely have to or it could have just been a quick sensor or software update sounds good uh, i'm gonna look uh, before we get into some more questions here i'm just gonna thank a few more people who, who have contributed we have a role sorry if i pronounce that incorrectly becoming a capcom member that means you get access to the discord and uh, we have Stefan saying, uh, can, can the Daily Hopper handle another scrub? Uh, I'm not too sure, to be honest. Uh, we also have uh, Raven becoming a Red Team member. That means you can access the multi-view on launch day and right now, I believe. Uh, we also have uh, Ten USD from Robinson Racing. No message, but thank you very much for the support. Uh, uh, and we have uh, someone called Ryan here, that's a good name, asking, uh, in the uh, in the uh, Twitter spaces that Elon hosted a, a couple of days ago, uh, he said, uh, Ship 24 will not land because we haven't installed legs. Uh, can slash should we read into that as far as catching the ship versus landing Falcon style? Sawyer, what do we think about ship recovery? I mean, that's a really good question. It's... 
I think a lot of it is you're just testing the basic systems at this point. Uh, there's already been so many upgrades anyway just to booster 9, and only imagine the boosters after that will contain even more upgrades. So at this point, I don't think they would need it back. They'll get all the data they can from the launch itself. The data will be beamed back to SpaceX uh, with both the ship and the booster. So at that point, I think they can gather all the data they need, especially for the first test flight. And again, it sounds like their priority at this point is just the actual liftoff portion. Uh, a question here from Antonio uh, asking, why did SpaceX decide not to retrieve the booster and ship? Aren't they going to try and soft land both of them on the water at least? Well, Antonio, I'm sorry to break it to you, but Ship 24 is unfortunately going to face palm into the Pacific Ocean mm -hmm. at terminal velocity. It's not going to be a very pretty sight. Uh, but Sawyer, uh, do we know what SpaceX plans to do with Booster 7? Uh, again, Booster 7, they are going to attempt to perform a booster back burn after stage separation, and then they will attempt to do a burn above the water. Now, they're not going to try and land on the water itself. Uh, I, my understanding is that this is basically going with the procedure that they'll have if they were to try and land back and, say, catch up with the chopsticks. But obviously there's no chopsticks to catch out uh, about 20, 30 miles away or kilometers away in the Gulf of Mexico. So... Um, it's going to try and do almost a full return, but then splash at the end. And uh, we've got a, little, a, f uh, a few more contributions coming in here quickly. We have Jack becoming a Capcom member. We have uh, Aditya, sorry if I'm pronouncing that incorrectly, becoming a Red Team member. And we have uh, Aussie with a super chat. Thank you very much for those. And uh, we have another question here from Euro asking, uh, or uh, uh, asking, have they confirmed which valve that was faulty slash frozen? And Sawyer, we've had a few more people join us uh, in the last half hour or so. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll throw this over to you to answer this question uh, uh, again. But do we know which valve was sticky? Uh, it was that one valve that got stuck. Other than that, they have not been uh, exact of what exactly where exactly on the booster that was in particular but we do know again per the original tweets that we got from elon musk immediately after and from spacex that there was a pressurization valve that got stuck or frozen depending on the terminology that you want to use uh in the position that uh caused the scrub the other day so uh they haven't gone full details of exactly what but uh they've said they've learned a lot and we'll be retrying in a few days uh, Keld Psych is saying in chat, new valve bought on eBay will only ship second class, hence TFR Friday at the earliest. <laughs> yeah, we could believe that as, 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 the, as the reason why. Uh, we have a question here from Mike asking, following a WDR, a wet dress rehearsal, how much liquid oxygen and liquid methane are they able to load back to the tank farm? Uh, now, Max, uh, I don't know if you know, uh, or if anyone else knows, the... Uh, recycle capability of Starship because there's a lot of propellant going into there, isn't there? There is. So I know they had to recycle the liquid methane uh, because that is a greenhouse gas and that is not um, helpful to be venting out into an open environment because that could be causing some issues, especially if there is a point of ignition. Um, I know they are free to vent uh, liquid oxygen or oxygen now, a gaseous at that point, uh, out of the atmosphere because it is it's harmless. Um, but it does take a while to refill the tank farm of, of locks. And actually just yesterday when we were going out to pick up our uh, remote cameras out at the pad, we were held up by a line of probably upwards of 10 to 15, uh, locks trucks. So, um, takes a lot of liquid oxygen to fill the tank farm and also then on to fill Starship as well. And just to give you an idea, I I'm trying to remember where I heard the number. It was in one of our, uh, back channels that the amount of propellant that just burns off during the course of the attempt is about as much fuel as you would see in a Falcon 9 fully fueled so that's how much is, fuel needs to be in these or excuse me propellants I should say need to be in these tanks between the liquid oxygen and the liquid methane so it's going to take a lot so I'm sure they were able to save a lot but when you're talking with that much fuel it's going to take some time yeah and for for uh, context, Falcon 9, even though it may look big, 
uh, I mean, it is big, but it is nowhere near the size of uh, Starship when stacked atop Super Heavy. Falcon 9 in total is about 70 meters tall. Uh, the full Starship stack is 120 meters tall. So coming up on twice the height of Falcon 9 is Starship. And it'll get even closer to that if we ever see uh, like a 10 meter extension on the ship or something uh, along those lines. Starship and Super Heavy are massive, massive massive vehicles and it feels like that kind of the the sense of scale you get when being on site uh, from what i've heard i've never been there but the sense of scale from being on site is uh, much different to seeing this uh, through the internet and uh, we have a question here from uh, northern asking can people in the uk see starship in its journey uh, now sorry to disappoint you but the uk and europe and kind of northern africa the middle east that kind of region is not going to be able to see starship at all uh, also in the, at the at the time of the launch window uh It'll be daytime here, so that would make it pretty much impossible to see anything going overhead. This is the trajectory which Starship will be taking, you can see on screen now. Uh, it'll be routing around the uh, between Florida and the Caribbean, threading the needle down through the southern half of Africa, tipping, uh, the, oh, just quickly nudging the bottom tip of Madagascar, going over northern Australia and overflowing Papua New Guinea, heading off to Hawaii. So that is the route. Unfortunately, uh, even pretty much most of Southeast Asia and, um, uh, and Asia and that kind of area, you will have a very uh, no chance to see it. Uh, I'm gonna sorry interrupt to you for, but I'm going to have to interrupt you for one quick second here. Uh, we have confirmation now that the next Starship launch attempt would be April 21st per the latest FAA planning advisory. So per the FAA, they are planning for a launch attempt on April 21st. There you go. That's the... That's... That's... that's uh, doubly, triply, quadruply confirmation that, that 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 April 21st is the date. So unfortunately, no meme for Elon, uh, but that is what is going to be happening. Exactly. Uh, Nemexio is asking, uh, I bet SpaceX wants, wants to get rid of this stack by launching as soon as possible, just like us. Well, uh, in the spaces with Elon um, uh, the other day, uh, Elon said that this vehicle, they want to just kind of get it out of the way in the nicest way possible. And Super Heavy and Starship are obsolete. Uh, ship 24 and Booster 7 have uh, uh, are obsolete compared to uh, the next ship along and Booster 9, uh, which have many, many uh, upgrades. Uh, Max, I don't know if you have any, any uh, word on this, on uh, just trying to get this ship and Booster out of the way. Um... Not necessarily. I think you, you you hit it pretty well on the head. Um, but I think the most valuable point of launching Booster 7 and Ship 24 is just it is an incredible opportunity to pick up as much data, which is going, which is invaluable to the launch team and everybody involved. So I think um, the, the main point to get uh, Booster and Ship 24 out of the way is just it's to collect as much data as possible. And if you would like to have your own one to 215th scale replica of Starship and Super Heavy in plushy form. That is now available for pre-order over at shop.nasaspaceflight.com. Our full stack plushies are finally ready for pre-order. Uh, we put out a little email uh, list uh, uh, notification thing a little while ago, but they came back uh, or they came available on the store itself a couple of days ago. So if you would like to get your hands on the Velcro detachable ship and booster, head on over shop.nasaspaceflight.com. That is where they are available. Uh, so uh, because we had some people with the first batch of plushies, which was just the ship back in 2021, said that they were uh, uh, they were being used as dog toys. Uh, so what you can do now is you can give one half to your dog and you can keep the other half for yourself. Uh, so that problem has been very well solved there and uh, you can see all of the little details you'd expect We've got the chimes. We've got the grid fins. We've got the flaps and we've also got the engines underneath both vehicles those uh, uh, All of those details and the plushie itself available at shop.nasaspaceflight.com for your uh, plushie uh, fulfilling needs uh, I do just there you go. <laughs> I want to point out well just really quickly in terms of the size of Starship, that is a, you mentioned it's a 1 to 215 scale model, and uh, it's still a pretty decent sized plushie. This is a 22 inch plushie with both uh, the booster and Starship, so yeah, it's it's fantastic. I can't wait for the plushies to come out, and especially when you compare it now to the real thing size-wise, it's unbelievable. 
So there you go. If you ever wanted to uh, truly know, get a sense for scale for Starship without actually having to go to Starbase, uh, you can just uh, pick yourself up a plushie and uh, multiply it 215 times. There you go. It's a it's a much more cost effective way to to <laughs> to realise how big Starship actually is. And, and I should uh, <laughs> clarify that's 55 centimeters for those who use metric as opposed to American units. And um, we we have a question here from Winchester. Uh, I suppose this is in reference to the fact that uh, Starship and Super Heavy kind of, uh, they don't have a separation mechanism. Starship's just going to be floating away from Super Heavy when the hooks release. Uh, Winchester's asking, do the plushies separate in flight when you throw them across the room? Uh, I can assure you they are Velcro together. Uh, unfortunately, our separation mechanism for the plushies are not as accurate as the real thing. Uh, sorry if that is a disappointment. And... Uh, uh, we, I'm going to look through some more questions here quickly, but first we've had a uh, tip here from Florida Space Nerd from tips.nasaspacesite.com. A bit more of a direct way to support us, uh, saying, loving all the coverage for an amazing moment in history. Uh, can we get a vlog from everyone in Boca Chica for the week? I think it would be fun to watch. Well, uh, unfortunately, uh, everyone's been very, very, very busy up on the roof of the Margaritaville Hotel getting stuff ready uh, for the uh, launch, but um, I think there may be some exclusive member photos and videos and stuff like that available for all of our members. That's the shop from the top of the hotel that's where everybody was uh, on uh, monday uh, so uh, yeah uh, unfortunately we've everyone's been extremely busy but member exclusive video photos uh, is all available for our members uh, here on uh, youtube if that is something you are interested in yep and just a note uh, if you're looking for a really good place to actually view any of these tests from it is a great place there the uh, margaritaville hotel there i believe there's a command for it for more info if you plan on taking a visit down there and uh, Whitney is asking, uh, will they have to safe the flight termination system in the event of a lightning storm? Uh, now, Max, I'll throw this over to you because you're usually based out of uh, the Cape uh, where we get a lot of thunderstorms. Uh, have we ever heard of flight termination systems getting safed in the event of a lightning storm? Not that I can recall. Um, I know, uh, I think, what, what was it, Apollo 12 that, that was struck by lightning? Uh, and had a bit of a of a troubles on ascent but not from what i've heard but i do know that launching when when there's any threat of lightning is no bueno if i if i can throw it back to some people's favorite and some people's least favorite rocket depending on who you are at nsf uh with the original aries one x flight they had an additional <laughs> concern there that was called tribo electrification which is basically the idea that depending on what clouds it's go through, it goes through at its particular angle, particular speed, that it could create its own lightning that would could potentially damage the onboard computers. So that would be the main factor in terms of lightning, would just be in flight in that case more so than worrying about it on the ground. I want to get some more questions into the queue here. There was a really good question. Uh, here we go, I found it again, uh, from uh, Techmaster asking, uh, what happens if it ruds over Cuba? Now, because it would have already had a lot, uh, because Starship and Super Heavy would already have a lot of momentum, uh, Max, I don't think anything will actually happen uh, around the Caribbean. Instead, won't most of the debris still be kind of, have the inertia to head out over the Atlantic? Yeah, that's correct. But by that point, uh, the, well, for one thing, the booster will, won't even be traveling that far. The booster will only be traveling out uh, over the Gulf of Mexico before attempting a boost back. Um, and by the time Ship 24 arrives over Cuba, it'll already be at a sufficient altitude and speed that it will basically, there's no possible way for it to just suddenly stop and fall on Cuba. Or if there was any kind of um, unfortunate either rud or anomaly, uh, Cuba would not, would not be threatened. So... Sounds good. Uh, we have a question here uh, about the uh, stacking operations, which we saw last week. Um, uh, as you can see, they're the chopsticks and the ship and uh, panning down towards the booster uh, from Ethan asking, how do they get the full thing on the stand? So Sawyer, uh, I, uh, I don't know if you want to just run us through uh, kind of how, how SpaceX used to stack the ship and the booster and uh, now how they do it with the chopsticks. Absolutely. Yeah, it used to be a lot of cranes. You would have mounting points that the cranes could attach to. You lift it up, do what you need to do, and put it back down. In fact, uh, on the top of the cells of the ship, there are currently 
uh, tiles over what were connection points for one of the large cranes uh, when they were working on it, I believe. Uh, as for now, uh, the chopsticks are basically what they use. There are connection points uh, that they can clip onto and will then raise the booster, rotate it, and put it down on top of the orbital launch mount. And obviously it's the same with the ship, except on top of the booster. So that happened recently in that you'll see the arms will close around it, pins insert, it lifts all the way up, swings around, and then back down. And that's how you stack a starship. Jonathan is asking, will there be onboard cameras on both the booster and a uh, ship for us to watch? Uh, Max, do we have any idea if we'll get uh, live uh, cameras from on board the vehicle? Well, luckily we had a pretty good preview of that during um, the now known wet dress rehearsal or the first launch attempt. Um, they, we, we had some beautiful angles from cameras, both looking downwards from the ship. And we had, I think, my favorite angle was there's a camera located in the interstage looking at all three sea level raptors and, and all three sea level, I'm sorry, uh, vacuum raptors. Um, so we there are multiple onboard cameras. On top of, we also have to, I, I, ha I want to give a special shout out to whoever is flying the drone out there for uh, for their videography because some of their, uh, their, live, their live stream footage from the drone was absolutely incredible, especially when, when it was all frosty and looking good. And uh, Florida Man is asking whether for uh, for Friday, for the 21st, and for that I'm going to throw it over to uh, Sawyer at the weather station. Uh, what are we looking like for, for Friday, Sawyer? Thanks, Ryan. Uh, latest forecast that we are seeing for Friday itself is partly sunny with a high near 82 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, winds around 10 miles per hour or so. And I should specify as well, the night before is mostly cloudy with low around 73 with winds, again, around 10 miles an hour. I mention that because that is essentially when they will start uh, preparing everything at the pad, closing up, and then get going. We'll be late into Thursday night into early Friday morning. Uh, there is no forecast as of yet uh, that I can see on, the, on NOAA's website that has the upper level wind forecast, but we will keep an eye out on that. Ryan. Back to you. Do you have anything with sports or cute animals? Uh, unfortunately not. But what I do have word uh, on is uh, Gary asking, do we have any word on the apogee of this test flight? And I believe it was confirmed for us uh, on in the first uh, launch attempt yesterday by SpaceX that uh, uh, Ship 24 indeed is going up to or is targeting to try and get up to 250 kilometers in altitude. Uh, which is about 150 kilometers above the Kármán line. Uh, of course, we need pretty much everything to go perfectly for Ship 24 to get up to that altitude. Um, uh, but fingers crossed that uh, SpaceX do manage to stick it on Friday, uh, which, if you're just joining us, is now the next attempt. Uh, Wednesday was scrubbed off yesterday. Uh, Thursday has been scrubbed off today uh, with some TFRs being jiggled around and new uh, notices from the Federal Aviation Administration. Uh, so Friday is now the day to look for uh, uh, and uh, for the maiden flight of a fully integrated Starship stack. As and I do Hoppy just want to point out, uh, on. for reference in terms of how high that actually is, the International Space Station is orbiting at about 400 kilometers in altitude. And Hubble's about 530, so just to give you an idea of how high that plan is. But we should also remember that Ship 24 isn't going to be completing an orbit for redundancy purposes. Just in case something goes wrong, it is not completing a full orbit. It's essentially doing uh, one of the, the world's longest suborbital hop. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if there's actually a title for that, but it's going to be taking off from uh, Texas, going the long way around the Earth, and then splashing down, face palming into the Pacific Ocean at terminal velocity just north of Hawaii, if everything goes to plan. As Elon has said, anything past Max-Q, or anything past liftoff, really, is a bonus. If Starship and Booster 7 don't destroy Stage 0, this is going to basically be categorised as a success. Uh, but in my opinion, uh, even if they can get through Max-Q, and it's going to be absolutely incredible. I can't wait for the energy that is going to be throwing, flowing through every single spaceflight fan at that moment in time. It's just going to be absolutely incredible. But anyway, dreaming on for Friday, we can talk about how we're feeling on Friday. On Friday. And, I do have one uh, question every day, for you really quick, oh, Ryan. Go on, Sawyer. You're talking about uh, the procedure where it's going to splash down into the ocean. Again, a reminder, there are no engine firings for Ship 24 after the initial phase of flight. So about 17 minutes in is the last time they are expected to fire in the entire flight. But 
what did you say it was going to do into the water? Facepalm into it? Yes, it's going to facepalm into the Pacific Ocean. Is, because is to say it's going to... To say it's going to crash into the, into the ocean... It's just it's just a bit boring, isn't it? If you say we're gonna, it's gonna face palm into the ocean. It makes it more human. It makes it more relatable. But in the U.S., we call it a belly S24. flop. We call it a belly, which is even more appropriate considering it has to do the flip maneuver to enter. But not a belly flop. But the the belly flop. The the entry and the landing maneuver is called the the belly flop maneuver. But in this case, it is going to be doing a literal belly flop. Uh, well, I, I feel like the terminal velocity part warrants a face palm because a face palm is quite forceful, you know. And I can, I just have an image in my head of Starship just kind of pointing down and just going smack into the Pacific. That's that's the image I have in my head of the Starship face palm. So I, I, I don't know if you, I don't if you disagree with that image that I have. I personally do. I think of it like you're belly flopping right into a pool. Again, the fact that you are literally, they call, we're calling the belly flop maneuver beforehand, that it is going to be belly down when it hits the water. Uh, that, yeah, I, I think that's the right term. And I know I've already started a war in the uh, chat at the moment. <laughs> uh, Jack, Jack Byer is saying belly slap. We have face plant. Uh, we, uh, uh, a synth guy is saying that they're face palming right now. Yeah, so we've we've started a bit of a discussion in chat. Uh, everybody coming up with their own um, uh, uh, suggestions there. And uh, everyday space nerd, sorry, I'll throw this over to you. Asking, did they get the valve unstuck? Do we have any word on what has happened to the to the sticky valve uh, that uh, scrubbed Monday's attempt? Uh, I haven't seen an official word of what they did to it to get it unstuck. But at this point, the fact that they are proceeding onward, it appears as if it is unstuck and they at least have knowledge of what went wrong so they can adjust it. Considering they originally planned to fly on the 20th uh, as their next attempt, now the 21st, uh, they're, it must be very confident in whatever they did to fix it that they're essentially ready to go pending fuel farm filling. Uh, Chris B has started a poll in chat <laughs> asking what is it belly flop face plant belly smack or other um, belly flop is becoming a very popular answer there uh, so sorry I believe your camp may be uh, correct in that one Thank um, you, but... <laughs> there you go uh, I'm going to run through some contributions if we're getting here and uh, Rob with a store message thank you very much for buying off the store there Rob let's see what you got uh, it is indeed the full stack, plushie available at shop.nasaspaceflight.com, a uh, 1 to 215 replica of the vehicle you can see uh, on your screen right now. Thanks very much for that, Rob. Uh, we also have uh, Faceman becoming a red team member. I believe Faceman is probably the person to ask about face planting or face palming, however you want to say it. Uh, but thanks for becoming a red team member there. Uh, Wesley with a store message says NSF is awesome. I happen to agree. Uh, did you get a full stack plushie? Yes, you did. Look at that. Many people enjoying the full stack plushie. And we also have uh, Kevin buying a uh, uh, an item off the store uh, saying thanks for your hard work documenting this amazing time. Can't wait to see this thing launch. And uh, they got the uh, patch uh, which was restocked uh, last week if you're interested in that on the t-shirt. Uh, uh, that's an item which is also available on the store. And uh, thanks for the uh, support here from uh, Mac Bain. And uh, we also have um, a uh, contribution here from Musical Walls yet again, uh, asking what's the Max G's S24 will face before separation. Uh, so Sawyer, do we know what the biggest uh, um, uh, or the, what the forces are going to be like? Uh, uh, maximum aerodynamic pressure. Uh, I don't know personally if there's a publicly available number yet for Max Q. Again, as mentioned, the maximum aerodynamic pressure on the vehicle. We do know that it is expected to occur about 50 seconds into flight. Uh, I would assume that the G-load is going to be within the same range as you would typically have in terms of uh, Falcon 9 uh, and Falcon Heavy. Uh, but again, it hasn't been officially stated how many Gs yet. And I'm sure that will also improve, in particular, when you get crew members on board as well. And uh, looking in chat here, there seems to be a little bit of confusion about what the launch dates and TFRs and no TAMs and all of this actually means. So we're just going to quickly run through it again, what the information is from the FAA that we have received so far. What you're seeing right now are all of the uh, temporary flight restrictions which are uh, uh, enabled uh, or, or will be in effect uh, around uh, Starbase 
uh, in South Texas. These are from the uh, Federal Aviation Administration in the US. Uh, I don't believe we've had word from uh, their counterparts in Mexico yet, but these are essentially the, the, the biggest NOTAMs that give us a clue of when Starship will be able to launch. So we can see uh, we have uh, uh, many different dates in there. That's the exact region that the TFRs will be covering. And um, so three have been issued. We have one for Friday, uh, which is the next attempt SpaceX are going for. We have one for Sunday, which is interesting because that's a weekend. And we didn't believe they were going to go for a weekend, but it looks like they could be able to go for a weekend. And then we also have one for a week's time next Tuesday. Those are the three new NOTAMs which have been published and these are the exact times you can see here they are in uh, universal time uh, so take six hours or uh, take five hours off of that sorry for daylight savings uh, that is the local time in starbase so it's still seven o'clock in the morning it's still the uh, exact opening time uh, but the launch windows precisely may have also shifted for example uh, when they were still targeting Thursday, the launch window had come down from 90 minutes to about 70 minutes. Uh, however, that's obviously not happening. So Thursday is no longer happening. It's going to be Friday, according to the Federal Aviation Administration with those new NOTAMs and TFRs. And also according to Eric Berger, who, who has some insider uh, sources, uh, Thursday definitely not happening friday is the next opportunity uh, for starship soya i don't know if you have any more information uh, on that for us at the moment yeah i do want to point out that according to the latest faa planning advisory that they put out the next starship launch attempt that they would be targeting would be the 21st so that would be uh friday if my date math is correct and uh yeah a lot of this right now is planning for timing there will be a full official notam that goes out which is notice to air missions as it is uh, known now and those will go out to all the individual pilots to make sure that they stay away when the time comes but the fa is at least putting this out there so pilots and everyone can start planning and in our case so we can start planning now too <laughs> yes um, gives the gives the crew down in Starbase a little bit of a uh, rest between uh, the ridiculous early hours on Monday and uh, what's looking like now the ridiculous early hours on Friday. You're funny, uh, them wanna... resting in Starbase. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they are hard workers down there. They are working day and night in the heat, in the humidity, in the bugs to make all of this happen and to get this stream up and ready and looking as great as all of our cameras do. So major, major props to the team at Starbase right now. I wholeheartedly concur with that statement. And this is the, the yeah, speaking, speaking of, of humidity, humidity. Yeah, 79% <laughs> at the moment. Uh, this uh, data is uh, from Port Isabel, just a few miles from Starbase. This is the, uh, unfortunately, this is the closest data we can get, uh, but it's somewhat accurate to what is currently being experienced at the pad. Uh, yeah, 25 degrees, 79% humidity uh, with 20 mile per hour winds is not the most comfortable working conditions. Uh, so yeah, the uh, big props to everyone who's working uh, at the moment uh, outside down at Starbase. Uh, thanks to Josh for coming for becoming a red team member. Uh, Andres, sorry if I'm pronouncing that incorrectly, uh, with a store message. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that's a patch there, uh, which uh, came back into stock a few days ago. And uh, Remy with 20 euros is asking uh, any idea about the G forces during both uh, the, uh, I, I presume you mean the booster return and ships uh, uh, face palm into the Pacific. I'm going to say it. I'm sorry. I'm going to say it. <laughs> the ships face palm into the Pacific. Uh, Max, do we have any idea on what the G forces are, or is that something SpaceX aren't really willing to share? Sorry, we're, I'm having a bit of audio problems. Can you uh, uh, repeat the question? Yeah, uh, do we know what the G-forces are going to be for the booster and ship return, or is that something SpaceX aren't really ready to share? That's certainly nothing, uh, no information that's public on that. Um, but I imagine, of course, as the fuel load gets lighter and um, the thrust increases, especially after liftoff, it's going to be, you're, you're going to be pushed back in your seat pretty, pretty well. Yeah, it's certainly not going to be a, 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 a light thing. Uh, and also uh, with a booster, uh, a uh, soft splashdown, quote unquote, soft splashdown in the Gulf of Mexico, Sawyer, um, it's not going to stay upright for long. 
Yeah, exactly. The plan for all of these is to sink to the bottom of the ocean either naturally, as in they hit hard enough and the debris sinks, or if not, uh, they have procedures in place that they can use to sink them. That includes opening up some of the valves to fill it with water, which in this case that would be a good thing if a valve is stuck open. Uh, and worst comes to absolute worst, and this is according to the official documentation, they do have the ability to sink it with a firearm. Yeah, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. If worst comes to worst, let's just shoot it and see if it will come down. Uh, yeah. By that point, puncturing the tanks, yeah, uh, it will get pretty flooded pretty quickly. Uh, we have a question here from Sandro asking, uh, do you think it will be feasible for Starship or the booster to use the depress vent to get away from each other upon stage separation? Uh, now, Sawyer, uh, at the moment, it's just going to ship's just going to drift away from the booster. Do we think that vents could be used for on-orbit maneuvering? Uh, the answer to that is definitely yes. Uh, that's part of the design with all of this as well. So yes, it will use a little spin, a little angular momentum centripetal force to separate it officially from the booster so that they don't bonk into each other. But at the same time, the main orbital maneuvering system type vent uh, engines that they plan on using are literally depressing the tanks at a specific spot so those vents that we see are also the same ones that will be used to help the spacecraft actually maneuver in flight rather than having to load up a whole separate type of fuel or something that could be potentially more hazardous and dangerous like uh the current high the hypergolic fuels that they use now so it's a little bit safer a little bit better for the environment and it's less stuff you have to carry if you already have it on board uh, uh, speaking of weather from earlier, John is asking, uh, what is the upper level wind speed, uh, wind shear kind of limit for Starship uh, that would make the launch a no-go? So do we have any idea on what wind shear would stop Starship, and uh, do we know if wind shear has uh, impacted any launches before? Oh, yeah, there have definitely been launches that have been legitimately impacted by it. Uh, a few space shuttle missions, uh, unfortunately, Challenger and Columbia had a little bit of that involved uh, with their uh, loss. But in terms of what we see now, uh, there are always concerns for the upper level winds, which typically are strong. It's not unusual to see them up to 100 knots. But if you're talking 150, 200 knots, not only pushing on you, but pushing on you sideways, that creates a lot of stress on the vehicle because uh, you've got the forces going down on it, pushing from the top as it accelerates, and then you get the force from the side with the uh, with the wind shear. So it could be a really bad combo. So that's why they keep such a close eye on those upper-level winds. And a lot of those are measured not just by satellites, but even sometimes by old-fashioned weather balloon. And that is uh, data that we get through uh, NOAA, if I'm correct, Sawyer. Yes, NOAA does okay. put does do daily uh, checks of the upper level winds, and typically on a launch day, certain ranges may do their own. For example, the forty fifth Space Wing may launch their own weather balloons out at Cape Canaveral ahead of a launch as well. All right, uh, we have a question here from AV ninety nine asking why is SpaceX using the chopsticks when they have the rocket landing legs already figured out? Uh, well, Sawyer, the, they have landing legs on Falcon 9, uh, but they don't really have legs on uh, the booster or the ship, do they? Uh, no, this is a little bit of uncharted territory. And yes, they now have the idea of how to land something back at, back at a specific point. That took years and years of practice to finally get even the first barge landing on CRS-8, and then to the point where now they're 100 plus in a row successful. Uh, as for this, you're talking a whole different beast. The dynamics of the vehicle are completely different. You're, you're talking nine meter diameter vehicle here. That's massive. Uh, you also need to take into account the size of the landing legs that you would need to be able to take all of that weight if they were doing landing legs. And in the case of the chopstick carry, it has to be exactly to a point and then hover. Whereas if you look at Falcon 9, it doesn't really hover. It slows itself down and then drops. This has the potential that it could hover until it's caught by the chopsticks when we get to that point. So it's a totally new ball game. It's a similar concept, but you're starting from scratch, basically. Uh, uh, Jax has uh, just chatted with a point here uh, saying just joined, heard the launch, it's now Friday, is that true? 
so yes, for anyone who's now just tuning in the last few minutes or so, the launch is now on track for Friday. Thursday's been cancelled. There's no more, uh, no terms or flight restrictions. SpaceX cannot launch on Thursday. It's Friday at the earliest uh, with uh, what appears to be, this isn't official confirmation, but we've seen this from the FAA, uh, uh, appears to be uh, temporary flight restrictions for Sunday and for Tuesday. That is what we're seeing. So that would be a primary launch uh, attempt on Friday, back up, uh, back up opportunities Sunday and a week from now next Tuesday. And uh, EMS uh, or EMZ, uh, sorry if I'm pronouncing that incorrectly, uh, is asking, will <laughs> will the laser show be there on Friday? Uh, Max, I don't know if you arrived in Starbase on time to see the laser show that was on the back of the high bay. Uh, not, uh, on the uh, Mega Bay, uh, High Bay 2. Uh, but uh, yeah, do you think that the laser show will be returning? Man, I hope it does. Um, you know, when when that was happening, I was actually out over by the, the launch pad, um, just getting some, some night shots of it. And it's kind of a, a curse and a blessing being there because while I may have missed the light show, I myself and a, a few colleagues of mine, we did uh, manage to catch a gimbal test of all 33 Raptors on the booster. We could hear it and we, and we could see all the all the engines moving and gimbling at various different speeds and directions. So but to answer your question, I hope that they do it again because I would love to see it. And fingers crossed they tag us when they're going to do it as well as so you actually know where to be at that time. Uh, although I, I'm sure they don't want to cause any traffic jams. And uh, Stephen here with a good question. Sawyer, I'll throw this one to you. If the ship is, uh, if we, if a ship is doing a limited engine test, so say if they're, I guess if they're only doing like a spin prime or they're only static firing one, two, three engines, uh, will the ship be fully tanked for those kinds of tests? Sawyer, are you talking well muted? Yes, thank you. Uh, in terms <laughs> of we in terms of past static fires that they've done we have seen it where they will load it up with just enough fuel to complete the static fire plus maybe a little extra just in case but for a flight like this again even though it's not going into orbit every single fuel tank will be filled to the top that includes the header tanks on the ship which would really only be used if it's trying to land and we know that it's not firing any of its engines after the 17 minute mark in flight basically and an hour and a half after liftoff it'll likely be at the bottom of the ocean so they might do it for that case but for any of these orbital test flights even if they're doing only 90 percent throttle which they are even if they're not planning on recovering the ship which is the case every tank will be full uh so there you go hopefully that does a good job at answering uh your uh, question there uh jim has a little bit of a contribution here no message but thanks for that jim uh we also have a storm message from robert saying awesome coverage keep up the great work we hopefully uh well we do hope that we do you got the patch on the t-shirt that's great lisa has been buying many items off the store thank you very much for that lisa uh we also have a uh question here from telstar 86 asking could spacex use the flight termination system to make the booster sink if a firearm isn't enough so yeah, what do we think the fts can be ignited uh after splashdown uh i don't think they would because if you think about even a falcon 9 launch there is a point where you'll hear them say fts is saved that means that the system is essentially disarmed so at that point, you're not going to use it. It's shut down. It's done its job, and that thankfully it didn't blow up when it wasn't supposed to. So at that point, yeah, no, they uh, would not use the FTS to sink it. They have plenty of other options. And uh, we have uh, uh, Werenika, so if I'm pronouncing that incorrectly, uh, uh, becoming a launch director member. That's one of the highest tiers of membership uh, uh that we have available so thank you very much for joining that tier uh, we also have thomas purchasing off the store i've uh, been watching since sn9 to have a beer once this is all well and done thanks again you're very welcome you got the patch there so uh, uh looks as if you'll be sewing that onto something soon uh, or putting velcro on it or uh, whatever takes your fancy with the patch and uh trent is saying thanks for the full stack pr plushie we really appreciate the technical conversations on the stream uh, and yeah i hope when you do uh, receive your plushie you will enjoy it very much again that is 22 inches tall that's nearly two feet tall that is not a small plushie whatsoever uh, so hopefully that you do uh, enjoy that when you get it I'm looking through here for some uh, more uh, questions. As while we, you're doing that, uh, I should uh, I should add. I saw the question at one point earlier. It is confirmed that the height of that is uh, one two hundred fifteenth scale to the real thing, about fifty five centimeters, twenty two inches, or between five and six bananas. 
<laughs> Thanks, Sawyer. <laughs> and uh, we have a question here uh, from uh, Jack asking, uh, where is the launch pad located? So for those of you who uh, are not aware uh, uh, of where exactly uh, Starbase and Boca Chica are located, hopefully we'll be able to bring up a map for you quickly. Uh, so what you're looking at right now is kind of uh, the North America. And as we zoom in, you can see we zoom into... Uh, uh, it pretty much looks like we're zooming into Mexico here, and that's because Starbase is right on the southern, southern, southern tip of Texas. You can barely get any closer to the border uh, with Mexico. Uh, so uh, there it is. As we keep zooming in, you can see the border there of the uh, Rio Grande River, and uh, you can also see high Highway 4, which is uh, where the ships and boosters roll along. Uh, you can see here Port Isabel and Isla Blanca Park. As we zoom in even further, Boca Chica Beach, that's the, uh, that's the public beach, uh, which has been there for a very long time. Uh, over on the left here, you can see the production facility, which is uh, uh, pretty much now attached to Boca Chica Village. And uh, that, uh, that little kink in the highway there is pretty much the route that the, well, it is the route that the ships and boosters follow on uh, self-propelled modular transporters all the way down to the launch site, uh, which is just a few meters away from the public beach there. Uh, underneath that little channel which comes in uh, up the north there so that is where starbase is located zooming back out again you can really get a context that this is pretty much as far south as you can get in the contiguous united states it even looks like it's much further south than the florida keys so there you go that is where starbase is located compared to the rest of north america uh yeah very very south and uh Cayman is asking here, uh, when launching Starship, does it uh, impact the flight paths for uh, planes? Uh, now, Max, uh, 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 there are uh, flight uh, regions which are not available to fly through during the launch. And uh, uh, does this impact uh, massively uh, Mexico to uh, uh, US traffic or like Caribbean to US traffic? Do we know uh, how many flights fly over the Gulf? Is it that busy or uh, are there busier, busier pieces of airspace around the world? Well, of course, the TFR stands for a temporary flight restriction, or other words, a keep out zone. Um, so that being said, I am not aware. Thank you for pulling up. I'm seeing it in the back channel now. I'm seeing some models of some, some air traffic, but it doesn't seem to be too heavily populated. It looks like the busiest route, um, air traffic route, is from Cancun to a location in Texas. So it looks like even uh, without the TFR, there doesn't seem to be too much air traffic in the area good uh, uh, uh of course when shutting off airspace it's a uh, it's something that has to go through many different uh kind of uh uh thought processes and things so this is i believe uh what the air traffic was like during the, the flight restriction uh, yesterday for the launch uh and yep. um uh, flight radar yep. also published a comparison to what it was like uh, a week ago yesterday uh, for um, uh, kind of a comparison there to see how many aircraft and there's not really that many aircraft in there so unlike launches from the Cape for example when you have loads of traffic coming in from Miami and Fort Lauderdale and Tampa and Orlando going up north towards like New York, Boston and uh, Washington DC that kind of the, the east coast routes that aircraft take not many flights were impacted I say probably I don't know uh, uh, so this is what it usually looks like uh, uh, on a Monday morning uh, there you go I can only see i don't know 10 15 aircraft that would have been impacted by 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 that at least in in that region at a time so so i don't think that many flights uh, compared to other pieces of pieces of airspace around the world would have really been impacted that much not terribly but it's interesting if you look at the the parts you can see where that uh uh restriction is very clearly because right now you see you got the planes circling it appear to be circling they're not in the middle of the gulf there you've got some uh, right above the yucatan peninsula and uh, you'll notice when we do actually launch, if you take a look at the planes in the sky, there will be a basic line right where those planes are right now, cutting through the Yucatan there that's basically just empty. Yeah, you'll be able to see straight down to the ocean uh, as uh, the air traffic clears a straight path for Booster 7 and Ship 24. Uh, Space Podcasts is asking... Uh, does S24 get scarred from its LOX loading? Does uh, the tank look like it is slightly discolored from the frost? Uh, Max, uh, does the frost around the outside... Firstly, what is the frost around the outside? Is that LOX or is that just ambient air uh, or ambient humidity water vapor? And uh, does the tank get damaged from that? Um, 
in terms of damage, I I know, um, oh, well, it's when these boosters in these ships are built, especially with stainless steel, there is a certain amount of there's a set amount of times the rocket can be fueled and detanked because, of course, with the fuel and the and the oxygen being cryogenic, they're so cold that the booster and and the material actually shrink a little bit, and over time, if you tank and detank enough times. You may cause a little bit of uh, fatigue in in the in the stainless steel, um, although we don't know how many times or what the limit is for for booster and for ship, how many times they, they can be filled and detanked. Um, in terms of it being scarred, I haven't noticed anything either on our cameras or in person at the launch site, but I'm planning on going there after we hop off, so I guess I can have a closer look. And uh, Sawyer, I seem to recall for SLS, there was some concerns about the tanking limits. So how serious can that get? It can get very serious in the fact that it, you're putting a lot of stress on the vehicle. So not only do you have the stress of the weight of the fuel, which is pretty heavy, so you got that pushing down. You also have the fact that it's super cooled. So you've got expanding and contracting and expanding and contracting as you put in cold propellants and then you purge it and it's warm inside and so on and so on so over time it could eventually uh cause issues with structural integrity but again these things are built pretty well that it takes a while to get to that point but it is definitely in the back of people's minds uh, i'm going to look through some more questions here thanks very much for that question space podcast first uh thanks to brandon for upgrading to red team that means you get access to our members multi-view uh, with all the different cameras around starbase that'll be live on launch day and i believe it's live right now we also have william with a store message asking uh or uh, just saying thank you to everyone at nsf for providing the coverage you do much love from connecticut you're very welcome william and you got the full stack plushie as well uh, an item that seems to be even more popular than the patch at the moment and I thought that the patch was popular and uh, we have a uh, uh, contribution here from Trade uh, saying how will SpaceX chill down the engines on the Starship portion of the rocket prior to stage separation Sawyer do we have any idea of how chill down on the, sh on the ship happens before stage set or is that just kind of all done on the pad uh, before launch I'll, you will see in most of the timelines that they do chill down the engines. That is all of the engines. So uh, from my understanding, if you could actually see some of the frost during the last attempt, uh, that it, they are cooling all of the different engines. So you've got the uh, Raptor vacuum engines, the sea level engines, and of course the ones at the base, the 33, all of which are chilled and prepared, I believe. Yeah. And um, I'm just looking through here for some more uh, I do want to point questions. out that we do have an update that just came in. Uh, we are hearing now that the, uh, there it is, the 20th is back on the FAA's TFR website, which you can now see on your screen. So does it, has the FAA now been just, has, have the FAA just been trolling us over the last hour or so? Because they've taken it, they took away the 20th. Added on some new dates, and now the twentieth seems back. So, we—I I just want to confirm—we still have had no official confirmation from SpaceX. We have had no tweets, no, nothing like that. We have no—we have had no official confirmation. We are barely guessing off of the temporary flight restrictions, which are being filed by the FAA around Starbase. And bear in mind, there are there are loads of different notices uh, for both aircraft and ships in the ocean. There are loads of different notices, so we can't really tell what's going on right now. But it appears as if, if this TFR is indeed for a launch attempt on Thursday, that the Thursday attempt is now back on track. This is a space operations area, as Kevin is highlighting there. So, yeah. This, it, this this does indicate that a launch is still on track for Thursday. However, I don't understand why they would have taken away Thursday just to put it back again. Uh, but, uh, yeah, Sawyer, I don't know if you have any idea on why the FAA might have done that. Uh, I don't know. Again, they may have just had to update it or something and accidentally took it down while they modified it to put it back up. Uh, I don't have the old one to compare to to see if it was exactly the same. Um but from what I can tell, reading it really quickly here, it looks very similar, and it may have just been a glitch. It may have been they thought, no, we can't go the 20th, and said, yes, actually, we can. So um, it's all speculation at this point. 
yeah, we haven't had any official word at all from uh, that. So uh, uh, if the official word from SpaceX does come whilst we are live, uh, we'll bring that to you. Uh, if not, make sure to uh, keep uh, uh, an eye on SpaceX's Twitter channels and uh, NASA Spaceflight's Twitter channels as well, uh, because we'll, we'll certainly be retweeting that as soon as that comes in. Um, uh, we may not even get any official confirmation from SpaceX if they're still on for the th Thursday because that's the last thing they tweeted. But uh, anyway, we'll, 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 we'll find out what happens as we get closer to launch. Uh, uh, Technique here is asking, Max, I'll throw this one to you. How many failed launch attempts do you think SpaceX can afford before they go bankrupt and have to cancel the program? Now... Uh, Max, uh, how does SpaceX make their money and do we think they're going to go bankrupt if they can't or if they struggle to launch the, uh, the Starship? Man, that is such an, an opulated, an opulated, an open-ended and speculative question. Um, with regards to Booster 7 and 24, ideally with them being, of course, obsolete, it's best to get them taken care of and off the pad as soon as possible. Um... No, they they have backing from NASA for Artemis, and they have just also recently signed for the first commercial uh, commercial payload of, aboard Starship as well. So, you know, with the amount of with, with the amount of backing they they also have from from Elon himself, I I don't foresee SpaceX having this issue with going having enough issues as far with Starship to be to be uh, concerned about that. Um, man. And I, I, I don't I just don't foresee the problem having having that many issues. And monetary wise, they do have plenty of other customers. Keep in mind, they have Falcon Nine and Falcon Heavy, which do have paying customers. They have their whole Starlink network, of which there are people paying to use the services. Although I believe it finally just started turning a profit recently, according to Gwyn Shotwell. But it's not like there's zero <laughs> income source at all. They still have. Uh, their other customers, the Department of Defense, private companies, all of that, Axiom, things like that. Uh, a question here from Ivy Gold asking, sorry, I'll throw this one to you. Hawaii is five hours behind Boca Chica. Ship 24 will land about 3 to 4 a.m. Hawaii time. So, uh, Soya, if the launch window opens at 7 and um, we take five hours off of that. Uh, but we also have to consider how long it would take Ship 24 to get around the Earth, don't we? Exactly. And from the timeline that SpaceX has put out, uh, the plan is to have that at approximately an hour and a half after liftoff. So it will be <laughs> traveling quite a distance in quite a while. So uh, hopefully that'll help figure out the timing. It still sounds like if they go within the beginning of the window, especially that it would splash down or belly flop as the pole one in darkness. Yeah. Uh, so, fingers crossed for some re-entry if the clouds aren't out in Hawaii. Uh, if you are um, due to be in Hawaii uh, uh, on Friday, uh, very early Friday morning, set your alarms, look kind of southwest, and see if you can see anything. I'm not going to promise you can see anything because we truly don't know what will be visible. However, if you want to, if you want a uh, I'd say decent chance at seeing Starship re-entering, if it does indeed get that far, make sure to set your alarms and have a little peek and if you do anything uh, then pro you should probably put it on social media because it'll go quite popular um, uh, with the amount of uh, attention that this maiden flight is getting not only from uh, all of our space flight fans but also most of the general public out there uh, at least from uh, um, uh, what I've been experiencing I have noticed uh, what was going on on Monday um, uh, Stephen is asking uh, 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 has the uh, international? I believe you mean the International Space Station here. Uh, is it going over South Texas uh, on Friday? Any chance of seeing it? Uh, well, uh, not Friday anymore. Sorry, Thursday. Uh, and any chance of seeing it? Uh, a cool shot. Can uh, Flight Club work that out for you? Well, Max, on Monday, the uh, the the space station did actually go ahead, uh, go overhead, but we didn't get to see it, did we? No, we didn't actually see it. I don't know unless you saw it out there, uh, Max. Um, I did not see it. Um, I honestly had no idea that it was going to be passing over. Um, but if you do want to be made aware of any potential passovers or uh, lunar transits or solar transits or whatever, I would recommend using the app called ISS Detector. That is the best way that I have found personally to best track 
or find out find opportunities to go see the, this, this the space station fly over and uh, I also believe uh, both NASA and ESA have their own maps as well. Uh, so there are many, many different options for you to be able to see uh, the, the path for the International uh, Space Station. So hopefully that answers your question, uh, Stephen. Uh, I do uh, want to point Sawyer, out... Well, do we, we have any more notes? Yes, we do. Uh, we also have an updated Notmar that is the Notice to Mariners that has come out now for Starship's re-entry that goes from April 20th to April 28th. So that's Thursday going all the way up to, looking at my calendar quickly, all the way up to n not this Friday, next Friday. So that's over a week of Not Mars available for uh, over, yeah, over a week of not Mars available in Hawaii. Uh, uh, the notice actually says from Hawaii to the Marshall Islands. So yeah, it's a massive exclusion zone uh, in the Pacific. So that gives SpaceX plenty of opportunities in order to uh, launch and re-enter uh, if they do not end up going on Thursday. Uh, whatever the launch date is now, I do not know because these these TFRs and not Mars are, are swapping in and out very quickly. I mean, we've only been going for 90 minutes here. Uh, coming up on 90 minutes and yeah <laughs> it's changed like twice or three times already in, in like yeah many many times uh, I'm, I'm gonna thank some of the support here quickly david with a store message over from shop.nasaspaceflight.com uh, uh thank you very much for uh purchasing the uh the full stack plushie and uh, that's uh, as i said earlier a very popular item at the moment and also thanks for the support here from uh matthews uh sorry if i'm pronouncing that incorrectly hey ryan uh i uh, yeah, yes, Sawyer? Uh, have we mentioned just how amazing that plushie is again? It's 22 inches, 55 centimeters, Velcro's apart, and uh, yeah, that way you can recreate your own event. And don't forget, uh, SpaceX should have used us when they had their scrub. You know why? What, why? Because we have patches. <laughs> Not just patches for the ship, but you can get your full stack plushies and special patches for this flight, all of them on shop.nasaspaceflight.com, right? Always always on top of the always on top of the puns, Sawyer. Thanks very much. And the transitions. Um, You're welcome. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so uh, if you if you want to have a look at the merch store, uh shop.nasaspaceflight.com. Uh, uh no Ronick uh, is asking uh, what is the maximum delta v uh, that starship can achieve now max starship uh, fingers crossed in future will be able of on orbit refueling or refilling as elon likes to say so uh, do we know what kind of uh, destinations uh, the ship will be able to reach with that capability uh well with the with the onboard refueling um i believe under its current configuration, could be wrong. Could, uh, feel free to correct. Uh, it could reach a train. It could reach uh, Mars, it, given the optimal window, um, and, and of course the Moon as well. Um, but of course, the Raptors are always under under a further development to gain further um, efficiency and performance. And if the tank is going to, if the ship and the booster are going to be stretched soon, that will also add additional uh, fuel for performance. So, to be for exact numbers and exact um, destinations, I wish I could tell you off the top of my head, but it is very, very capable. And an interesting question here uh, from uh, Chen Hang. Sorry if I'm pronouncing that incorrectly. Uh, asking, uh, Sawyer, I'll throw this one to you. When do when do you think that space travel will become affordable? I think of it kind of like we had with the uh, with airplanes. It started off. Very simple, people learning the ropes, and then eventually going to crazier, bigger planes, and onto jets and things like that. Once we finally got to jets, they started flying people, but yeah, they were very expensive and probably more importantly, very dangerous at the time. There was a lot of uh, issues with the early jet programs. And eventually they worked it out, got it better, and then once they got it down super routine, things got cheaper. So I think we're kind of along that same timeline there. And where we are in relation to... Uh, jet travel development, I would say we're at the point of we're just getting to the jet age here of trying new things that may not work entirely that are still quite expensive. So I'd say we're about halfway through that progression. So hopefully in the next 15, 20 years, it'll be close enough to flying on it like flying on an airplane. 
Uh, Sawyer, I'm I'm just trying to think of an analogy here. Do you think that maybe like the commercial resupply services would be uh, like uh, space flights equivalent to like the air mail contract that the U.S. government were handing out back in like the the twenties and the thirties? I think that's a good way to put it. Yeah, the U.S. contracted out these private pilots basically to say, hey, we need you to fly mail from place to place for us, get it there quicker. It's the same kind of thing. NASA saying, hey, SpaceX, we need you to send up this vehicle so that we can get supplies to the ISS. So that's actually a really good comparison. There you go. So, uh, yeah, fingers crossed. Uh, I think we all want this to become uh, much more affordable than it is right now. And Starship, what you're seeing right now on your screen, is the vehicle that Elon Musk and SpaceX hope to make that future possible. And, uh, yeah, rapid reusability is obviously a big part of that. Uh, and uh, Chris Birkin pointing out in the back channel that point to point is also awesome. Every, everybody, <laughs> point to point's biggest fan, Chris B. Uh, yeah, point to point. Uh, uh, I, I would say not replacing air travel, but uh, becoming an air travel competitor. Um, uh, yeah, that's also a, a big uh, uh, service that Starship is theoretically able to operate. And um, for this flight, at least, uh, technically, it is going to be a point-to-point -point flight. It's not going into a full orbit. It is going up to 250 kilometers. And if this was a true point-to-point -point flight, it would be going the other way around the Earth. But it's going this way for um, the purposes of the test flight to fly over the Gulf to make sure that if anything bad does happen, it does not impact any population centers. It's going uh, threading the needle between Florida and Cuba, overflying the southern half of Africa, just... Uh, just uh, um, booping the bottom half of uh, Madagascar and uh, going north of Australia and overflowing Papua New Guinea uh, to end up near Hawaii. And uh, Martin has become a Powered Rap member. Thank you very much uh, for that. And uh, we have a poll here uh, uh, in chat uh, about the launch date. Or we did. Uh, it's just finished. 72% uh, uh, of people think that we're still going for the 20th. Uh, the remaining... Uh, uh, 27, 28 percent ish of people believe that it will not be going on the 20th. So that's what the general consensus is. Uh, Max, do you, do you agree with that? Do you think they got very close on Monday? Do you think that Thursday could actually be uh, a possibility for Super Heavy and Starship? I mean, weirder things have happened, right? Um, I mean, of course, with the FAA putting this um, TFR back out there, it, it they must they must think it's possible for for SpaceX to uh, get it off the pad. They wouldn't. They wouldn't issue it if SpaceX wasn't or or uh, wouldn't be ready. So, um, cr I cross your fingers. But I personally, I I wouldn't rule it out. Uh, and a store message here coming in quickly uh, from uh, Cliff. Uh, 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 thank you very much for that. Uh, you got a, a metal print there, which is a uh, uh, those are very high quality. Uh, and you get to see pictures that our photographers have taken. You get to put them on your wall, uh, which is also wonderful to uh, uh, look at every day. Uh, we have uh, Gamer Tom becoming a Powered Rap member. Thank you very much for uh, that contribution. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I feel that uh, on that note, it is time to wrap things up. So thank you, Mr. Sawyer Rosenstein, for joining us today uh, the, on the, uh, the, the opposite to uh, launch eve, uh, launch, the launch after party. That didn't happen it's an after party and a pre-party all in one so uh glad to share it with everyone and uh make sure you stick to all of our social media platforms and the website and everything so keep up to date on exactly when the launch date will be and joining us from the site we have had uh, max evans thanks very much max hey, thank you much for, uh, for having me it was a great time being it was a great time to be on and uh, in the background, pushing the buttons and uh, operating the the Google Maps, we've had uh, a Kevin uh, uh, doing all of that for us this afternoon. Uh, now kind of becoming evening down in South Texas. And I've been Ryan Cage, and I've been your host for today's show. So, Thursday, is it going to be? You'll know if it's going to be if we're going to be live on Thursday. If you see us live... Uh, uh, then it's probably going to be on Thursday. Uh, so, uh, you know how to get back to the channel Uh Make sure to tune in on Thursday, if it is indeed on Thursday, because we're going to be very excited for it. But for now, thanks for watching, everybody, and goodbye. And here we go.
Our 68 chamber pressure looks good. Following up.